This has been a tough year for everyone, but it's uh, particularly tough for young people. I know uh, my kids at home have uh, uh, had a huge uh, tough time of it, not seeing friends the same way, uh, not being able to do the same kinds of events, uh, but also a deeper concern about what this is going to mean for the coming years. And I know that's particularly as many of you reach uh, the end of high school, uh, reflecting on how is this going to impact uh, the coming years, uh, your path through university, your path into the job market, and uh, potentially uh, you know, impacts economic and jobs and growth uh, for you uh, for many years to come. And that's something that we're very, very much aware of and focused on. Because we have to make sure that any scarring that can happen, as happens in recessions and in crises, uh, does not uh, limit your capacity to succeed. Because we need you. We need you to become and be the extraordinary, uh, powerful agents of change uh, that I know uh, you intend on being. Jay Lynn from St. John's. Uh, go ahead, Jay Lynn. Um, hello. Um as a uh, citizen of Canada, and particularly Newfoundland and Labrador, I'd like to know what measures short-term and long-term the government is taking to save the environment, and what plans are being made to lessen our reliance on damaging non-sustainable resource sectors such as oil and gas? Well, I know that's a, that's a great question, and it's a question that impacts everyone across the country. There is no question that we need to do an awful lot more uh, to fight climate change and protect our environment. We've done a lot as a government over the past five years. Uh, we brought in a, a price on pollution right across the country. Uh, we've moved forward on massive investments uh, in renewables, in decarbonization. Uh, we've invested in research and innovation and new technologies. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we know there's more to do. But the world's not going to decarbonize overnight. There is going to continue to be a need uh, for oil and gas in Canada and around the world for a long time still to come. And what we need to focus on is the transformation of our energy mix, the decarbonization of uh, our energy production, uh, and uh, eventually reaching net zero by 2050. And that, that means investing now to be part of developing those solutions. You know, Canada's greatest resource is our people. Uh, you know, forward thinking, innovative, hardworking, ready uh, to build a better future, uh, ready to, to lean on our neighbors and work hard together. Uh, there's no question about it. But we're also a country of extraordinary natural resources. And I think uh, by adding the innovation, the dynamism, the diversity of perspectives that we have across the country and from around the world, uh, we're going to be able to ensure that there are great solutions great jobs, uh, great path forwards for communities, some now dependent on, on uh, traditional energy industries, but already thinking about how we create those better solutions, whether it be uh, carbon capture use and storage, whether it be hydrogen economy, whether it be uh, more hydropower, whether it be uh, innovation around all sorts of different ways. Um, we can move forward understanding that you know, even a sector like mining, which is you know, seen as sort of a, a, a part of Canada's past is more important now than ever before. The critical minerals that we need uh, to build batteries, uh, to create electric grids, to, to create the new technologies we are reliant on every day, many of those critical minerals can come from Canada. And there are ways to recognize that we'll always be a country of natural resources, but being world leading in how we develop them, in how we ensure good, sustainable, innovative jobs uh, for future generations of Canadians right across the country is uh, what we are very much focused on right now. And I would just add particularly to you young people, um, this budget includes really significant investments in this Canadian pivot to a green economy. We know that's where the world is going and we want to be sure that Canada is there to be part of that economy. So there are real investments in clean tech, government investing in it and creating tax incentives for companies to do it. As you guys are thinking about your careers, think about preparing yourselves to be leaders and innovators in that space. And Jalen, since I am sitting in Toronto right now and you are in Newfoundland and Labrador, I want to say a personal thank you from Toronto. All the front pages of the papers had pictures of those great healthcare leaders from your province 
coming here to Toronto to take care of us. And it was just so heartwarming. It really felt like help was there. And to me, that's an example of Canadians supporting each other. So thank you very much, Newfoundland and Labrador. Toronto is grateful. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. Mr. Prime Minister and Mrs. Deputy Prime Minister, Canada has always prided itself on Tommy Douglas's vision of universal equal health care for all. But COVID-19 has shed light on the vulnerability of seniors, Canadians with pre-existing health conditions, and workers without paid sick leave. The fault lines of inequality within our health care system have been further exposed since the beginning of the pandemic. One in five Canadians currently have inadequate coverage or no coverage at all for highly priced pharmaceuticals. And almost 60% of Canadians report having no access to paid sick time. We strive to be a country that preaches equality, but millions of Canadians do not have access to affordable life-saving me medications or paid sick leave, which is also proving to be life-saving to limit the spread of COVID-19. Not all of us are so fortunate to have drug plans or be able to stay home during these times, Mr. Prime Minister. So my question for you, Mr. Prime Minister and Ms. Deputy Prime Minister, will your government commit to fixing the fault lines of inequality in our healthcare system and commit to bringing in universal primary care and paid sick leave to create a more equal Canada for us all? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for your question. It's, uh, uh, it, we have seen uh, this pandemic reveal gaps that have been there an awfully long time, and it is uh, not right for anyone in this country uh, to have to choose between paying their rent or groceries or life-saving medications, and that's unfortunately a reality for too many. Uh, we also know the need for sick leave, which is why we move forward on sick leave, uh, both in federally regulated industries a number of years ago uh, and uh, a special pandemic relief package uh, uh, that people can and apply for directly. In the budget, we commit to putting in place the foundational elements for pharmacare across the country. And that starts with $500 million for our national strategy to pay for the high cost drugs for rare diseases. But you've asked about a couple of other things that I think are really critical to the approach. And one is supporting people who are sick and at work. One of the really important things in this budget, um, which actually um, I want to give credit to our colleague, Sean Frazier, who really fought for this on behalf of one of his constituents, is we have extended the EI sickness benefit from 15 weeks to 26 weeks. And Sean really pushed us on that because he had a constituent whose husband really needed that support and didn't have it. So it's going to be there now. Canadians deserve it and need it. As the Prime Minister said, in federally regulated industries, we already have three days of paid sick leave and you can take five days off. And we would really encourage provinces and territories who can do it to step up. Morgan, I think you're in PEI, and PEI is one of the provinces that has stepped up. So well done, PEI, on that front. And then just kind of in closing, you talked about two groups of people who are particularly affected by the challenge of taking care of themselves when they're sick, and that is older Canadians and lower wage workers. And this budget has so much to support both groups. In this budget, we are raising the OAS by 10% for people 75 and older. So that's really good news for all of our parents and grandparents. COVID has been so rough on them and we're glad to give them that extra support. And the Canada's worker benefit increase that we have in this budget, uh, it's something that anyone who cares about inequality in Canada and who cares about the most vulnerable should really be excited about because right now, sadly, you can work full time and still live in poverty. But we have support for people in that position. It's called the Canada Workers Benefit and it tops up your wages. And with this expansion of more than $8 billion, more than a million additional Canadians are going to get that top up. It's going to raise 100,000 people out of poverty. So really important for the issues you care about, Morgan. And thank you for raising them. There has been an alarming rise in anti-Asian hate crimes all over Canada ever since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Besides having a tremendous amount of undocumented attacks, many incidents of discrimination against Asians aren't viewed as crimes, considering the difficult history of prosecuting hate in Canada. 
What measures are you planning to take to prevent anti-Asian hate crimes and protect the Asian community from further prejudice encounters? Oh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia. It is such uh, an important question. We have seen a rise in, in hate crimes in general, but uh, particularly a rise in anti-Asian uh, hate uh, over the past uh, past 12 months that is extremely, extremely concerning because it's, it's not who we are. Uh, Canada is a country that understands that diversity is an extraordinary strength, not a weakness, and the desire to be there for each other, be there for our neighbors, and learn from each other and figure out better ways of moving forward needs diversity and needs respect. Unfortunately, this is a time of uh, tremendous anxiety and stress, uh, and in that sometimes the worst uh, of humanity comes out, the, 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 whether we see it as a, a, a rise in gender-based violence and domestic violence, whether we see it as a rise uh, in hate crimes and intolerance, whether we see it as a rise in, in polarization and, uh, uh, and, and virtual attacks uh, on the internet. Um, there is something we have to be dealing with head on as a society. Um, I have, uh, and we will continue to speak out strongly against uh, hatred, against uh, anti-Asian racism. And one of the ways we can do that concretely is uh, is ensure that we are all talking about it. And, and the words we use and how we uh, refer to things either uh, as, as uh, well, I mean, in the beginning, uh, reflection on on this virus as as a China virus or as a, uh, an Asian virus. I mean, these are things that uh, unfortunately stigmatize certain people. And even today, as we see the terrible challenges uh, going on in India and Pakistan, uh, we're seeing a spike uh, in intolerance or concern around Indo-Canadians uh, that we've seen for quite a while around uh, uh, East Asian Canadian, East Asian and Southeast Asian Canadians. So. We have to be really, really vigilant in uh, the way we talk about things, the way we shape things. And when we saw uh, irresponsible politicians, uh, uh, you know, bringing up suspicions around the extraordinary uh, uh, Teresa Tam, who's our, uh, uh, who is a national treasure and our, our chief public health, uh, 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 yeah, chief uh, officer of health in Canada. Um, and that has no place in Canada anytime, but certainly not during a pandemic when we need to be there for each other.